do so. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and to enjoy the relationship that we have with each other and to enjoy your word as Lynn presents it. We want to give a special thanks to all of the mothers in the world who Amen. do so much to raise children like us <laughs> and to bring us uh, before you. We thank you for everything that you do. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Nice touch on the Mother's Day, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you guys will do me a favor, Dan, we're going to go ahead and start the recording. And then if you could mute everybody except me, then I'll start to prattle on after that. Dan, I unmuted myself. If you guys can hear me, everybody give me a thumbs up. All right, thank you. All right, um, Dan, go ahead and start recording session one, please. And uh, I don't see you on your screen, but if you somehow can communicate to me in a chat that you are, okay. Nope, there's your thumb up. It's really big and it's in my face. Okay, uh, guys, we are gonna be studying today another fun section of First Peter fun simply because I get to have stones thrown at me after all this is over. You'll see why in just a minute. I welcome all the ladies who are on board with us today. That's going to make it even more uncomfortable to go over the topics I have to cover. But uh, I don't write this stuff. I just report the message. So if you could turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. We are going to go through verses 1 through 7 today. It's what God wants us to know about the topic of marriage. Before I do that, I'm going to give every week, I give you a, a very condensed, accelerated five-minute recap of what we've covered so far in First Peter. So set your stopwatch. Here we go. Basically, Peter is written by Peter, the apostle, one of the big heavyweights. He may have used John Mark, the writer of the Gospel of Mark, as a scribe, but nonetheless, these are Peter's words. It's being written somewhere around AD 62-ish, give or take a year on either side. Um, and this was very important because at AD 64, Rome's going to burn, Nero's going to blame the Christians, and from there on, there's just going to be wholesale um, murder, torment, execution of the Christians. We've discussed this in the past. Over the next 250 years, roughly 6 million men, women, and children, Christians, will be executed, tortured for their faith. Um, it's an unprecedented time of persecution for the church. So this is the environment Peter's writing into. Um, but it was also a letter of encouragement, because if they did it right, if they suffered well, if they, if they conducted themselves like God wanted them to conduct themselves, it would pay off in huge dividends, not only for them personally in heaven and now with peace and purpose, but it would pay huge dividends for the eternity, for the kingdom of God, because we went through a period, that same 250 years, of an unprecedented percentage-wise period of growth for the church. So much so, the church versus the Roman Empire, not a gun was raised, not a sword was raised, not a, a stone was tossed by the church. And over that 250 years, Christianity so permeated the Roman Empire that by early uh, 300s, 8312, 316, 318, somewhere in that range, it did become the state religion of Rome. So Christianity won, but not through the ways we typically think and the ways of warfare. And this is what Peter has been talking to us about. First of all, he talked about governments. And if we are subject to government, God placed that government over us and we're to be good citizens. We're to be good citizens in obedience. We're to be good citizens in attitude. We're to be good citizens. And he even raised the point what happens if you have a sucky government? You're still supposed to be a good citizen. 
Now, there are caveats laced all throughout this, but I'm not giving you an escape clause yet. Let me finish. Then he went on to talk about the relationship between masters and slaves. Now, why was this appropriate? In the culture Peter was writing, uh, estimates from today's historians say between a third to a half of the entire Roman Empire were actually slaves. And this is not hard to understand because obviously as you um, conquered neighboring countries and you would take these people captive and make them subject to you, that becomes now your labor force, your slave force. So Peter says, hey, be a good servant, be a good slave. We could translate to employee today. Be a good employee to your master. What happens if your master is a mean master, a bad master, a poor master? You're still supposed to do this. And throughout all of these examples, he's saying, basically, people are going to watch you and people are going to see that you return hatred with love and you return persecution with prayer for your persecutors, your tormentors. And this is the catalyst for change. Um, so he's telling slaves that he's telling employer employees that he's telling citizens of countries that even if you have a bad government so now that kind of brings you up to chapter three now what i'm going to do today is i'm going to read verses one through seven new king james version straight through then we'll go back and backfill a couple of verses at a time um, peter's trying to get across a very important message and that is if the church pulls away from the world and pulls close to God, they will not only have peace and purpose, they not only will have an eternity in heaven, which is gonna be awesome, but they will impact the world for the kingdom of God. And many people will have their eternal destinations changed if we will only follow this pattern. Um, and we did see this come to pass historical. So starting in verse one, wives, Likewise, likewise, meaning the same example he's been giving about governments and citizens, masters and slaves. Likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging of the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle, meek, and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, deal with them, your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So let's go back up to verse one and two and start there, and we'll, we'll just backfill a little bit and what the context of this is, what is Peter really trying to communicate specifically first to the wives. Now, the first thing I want to transmit to the ladies there, um, and you can give me a thumbs up. Hopefully, you won't produce any other finger into the, um, the, the uh, camera when you give me an approval or disapproval, but I think it's intentional that God starts with the women on the instructions. Number one, he gives six verses to the women and only one verse to the men. That should imply men are pretty simple. Uh, but six verses to women, only one to men. I think the verses given to women are probably harder to do uh, than what he's asking of the men. But you'll see this come out as we, as we dig through this, why this order and why the numerical superiority of the passage towards women versus men. So the first thing I'd like to say is I would wish this was a one-off scripture from 1 Peter that then we could try to discount and explain away and all. So if you want to believe that, the first thing you need to do is take Ephesians 5 and just kind of tear it out of your Bible 
uh, get your shredder handy and go to 1 Timothy 2.11 and dump that one in the shredder. Uh, if you need some fire starters, go to 1 Corinthians 11.3 and tear that page out. And then if you have a parakeet or a parrot or a bird or some kind that you keep as a pet, then you can take Colossians 3.18 and use that for birdcage liner because they all say the same thing. It all has to do with the sequential order of how God wants the home to be run. And it all they almost all say the same thing about wives submit to your husbands. So this is, this is hard enough as it is, but then he says, even if some do not obey the word. So again, he's repeating the same pattern that we saw with governments, that we saw with slaves and masters. Even if you have a bad husband, and there are bad husbands, even if you have a bad husband, you're to set the example. You are to take the high road. You are to be the leader in this respect in that you're to have these qualities of having this meek, gentle, submissive spirit. You're not to do it for any other reason other than this honors God, and this is what he is telling you to do. So now, in some of those verses I just quoted, specifically if you go and, and refer to Ephesians 5.21, the, the end game, the ultimate goal, is that both husband and wife submit to one another, that they, that they are um, in, in a partnership, an equivalency. That's the ultimate goal. But at the end of the day, if a decision has to be made and there's a not agreement between the two, then the man is supposed to make that decision being led by God, and I will give you later what those consequences are. Um, now, we don't see this in our culture. None of this. Some of you, um, I'm just trying to pick on somebody, but even some of our elder participants, I'll just put it that way, they might remember a time when this was more our social norm in this country. Okay, I see, I see the one head I was referring to nodding in my, uh, yes. Um, but it is not the norm anymore. In most Western cultures, whether those cultures are uh, Western European, Australian, American, this is so far removed from, from where we are today, both on the male and the female role. Um, and you would have to go back, like I say, quite a few ways, decades, before you would have seen this a more accepted teaching. Uh, so let me define what this is, because immediately, all these exceptions and objections come to mind. Uh, what happens if you have an abusive husband? What happens if you have a sadistic husband? What happens if you have a violent husband? God has the same escape clause or provision out of Acts of 419, which basically says, obey God, not man. So, and he used that in scripture to give us balance. So again, I used illustrations last week and the week before, I'm a German soldier. I'm, I'm fighting for the fatherland. As far as I know, I'm on the side of riot. I'm killing, um, unknowingly, but I'm killing, frankly, brothers in Christ who are wearing a British uniform or a French uniform or an American uniform. And there's no hatred involved. I'm just doing my duty. And then I get picked up and I get repositioned into a concentration camp like Auschwitz. And I'm asked to do unspeakable, heinous acts to innocent civilians, women, children, defenseless. As a Christian, I know that crossed the line. And what I'm supposed to do now is disobey the authorities that are put over me uh, and refuse to do them. Obviously, it's going to probably result in my imprisonment or execution. The same for a slave if he's commanded to do something by his master that's reprehensible in the sight of God, I know who you're supposed to obey. You obey God, not man. If you have a husband who's saying, hey, we could kidnap the person next door and hold them for ransom. Hey, we can gain access to these elderly people's home and, and uh, fleece them out of their money, out of their checking accounts. Um, I know exactly what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to disobey your husband. Exactly. Because you are supposed to obey God over man when the two conflict. But in general workings, day-to-day -day of marriage, wives are to submit to their husband in attitude and heart. They're supposed to have this uh, mental, gentle, meek, 
uh, uh, spirit about them in doing so. And because of that, their husbands will follow suit and start stepping into the role that they are supposed to fulfill, that God ordained them to. So here's the problem. Men in the last 50, 60 years have utterly abandoned their role that God gave them. They have acquiesced their role. They have walked away. We've got so many single moms out there from men who impregnated women and then skipped town and have done it repeatedly. They're not men, they're like children. They're not owning up to their responsibilities. You have other men who may be physically present, they haven't physically abandoned the marriage, but they come home and they sit on the couch, they plug into ESPN, pop their six packs, and that's it. They are vacant in every other way. They don't run their home, they're not accountable for their actions, they're like little boys who still need a mother. And this is commonplace or video games, or whatever diversion. It's all about pleasing them. And they leave the, the wife and the kids high and dry. They may be physically present, but they're not doing their job anymore. So nature abhors a vacuum. So the women have to step in and do what the men are supposed to be doing. And, and, and our whole structure of marriage in Western culture is completely upside down and broken. Now, God still works within it, God still makes it work, but guys, we've got a 40 to 50% divorce rate in this country, and that even applies to the Christian marriages. So we have allowed culture to brainwash us into the wrong way of running marriages. God made us, God constructed us. He has the owner's manual, and he knows exactly how we should work, how we are wired to work, and if we would just follow his way of doing things, everything would go so much smoother. So let's press on. You look at submission to authority. The first thing you look at is, oh, wow, that sounds wimpy. That sounds like I'm a doormat. Um, well, don't look any further than, than Jesus. Jesus submitted to the authority of his parents. You don't think Jesus was superior to his parents in every way? But as a child, Jesus submitted to his parents, even though Jesus was in fact their creator. Wrap your mind around that one. Jesus submitted to the authority of God the Father, but Jesus and the Father are co-equal. They're, they're the same, they're equivalent. So submission has to do, and meekness has more to do with power under control than it does inferiority or inequality. Uh, it has nothing to do with any of those things. If there's anything we've covered well in Breaking Bread is that all people are created in the image of God. All people are equal. Slave, master, king, citizen, husband, wife. We are all created in the image of God. Race has no bearing. And by the way, when you um, start to rile up hate towards a a certain group of people that may uh, advocate hate and violence towards Christians, if you direct that towards uh, Islam, uh, Muslims. Um, be careful with that because God made them, that individual, in his own image, and we are to honor them. It doesn't mean to honor their viewpoints, honor their religion, honor their belief systems, but as individuals, God wants to save them just as much as he wanted to save you. Nod if you remember. Do you remember the illustration about Jesus throwing the lines in the muddy water and you guys are all going to be swept to your death and you grab a hold of the line and Jesus pulls you to safety? Do you remember that illustration? Our job is to, Jesus gives us the lines. They're all tied to him, but he sends us out on top of the roof, onto the, on the, the, the ledge, onto the tree limb and says, throw as many lines in the water. Try to get people to grab a hold of these lines. That's our role. And Everybody's the same. Everybody is equal. But in marriage, there is an order, just like there is in church, just like there is in government. In all society, there's order. I had a boss for many, many, many years. For 38 years, I had a boss. My boss wasn't superior to me in the sense of intellect, spirituality, uh, rights. Um, my boss and I were the same, but there was an order in work in the military. I'm looking at Ned. Ned's retired military. I think Colonel, right? 
Once you retire, Colonel Ned. I mean, did you ever have a, what's hiring a Colonel, a general? Okay, okay, just <laughs> nod because I can't hear you. Uh, so, Ned, did you ever have a general that was a knucklehead above you? But did you still have to obey him? Yeah. Now, if the general ordered Ned to go out and slaughter a bunch of innocent children on the street because there was some kind of a social upheaval going on, Ned would look and say, I can't do that. I'm sorry. You're the general. You're the boss. I know there's going to be consequences. But the fact that your husband is a knucklehead doesn't give you the latitude to not obey God. Are we getting this? Especially ladies. Can the ladies that are on video either nod yes or no? Okay, I'm getting a couple of yeses. So submission in marriage follows these same principles. These same, it's just a different sphere. Um, that sphere is limited in this scripture to marriage. One more time. The sphere we're talking about today in 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 through 7 is marriage. Some denominations, they're brothers and sisters in the Lord, they'll be with us in heaven, but they've taken this scripture and run off in a totally wrong direction with it. We'll see another one that's coming right up in the same way. They, they take men and say men are to be the boss of everything, because God says so. No, it says in marriage, the man's the, the leader, the woman is the follower, the women is to submit, submit to the man in grace, in love, in meekness, in gentleness. But it doesn't apply that. I mean, you can still have women CEOs. You can have women bosses. You can have women presidents. You can have women governors. You can, there's, no, there's nothing in scripture that prohibits that. And if you take this and go off in the wrong direction, you're reading more into the passage than it's saying. So that's, that's one point I wanted to divert to. Um, the other thing is, and I have to be careful with this. Women have certain natural qualities that they can use to their advantage. For instance, if they want their husband to do something for them, they can use some of their womanly wiles. Now, some of those aren't charming, like I'm making it sound like some could be nagging and badgering and, um, you know, hounding you to death to do something. Um, you can do all that to change your husband. But you know what all this boils down to? Is if you do it God's way, you have to trust God with the outcome. Just like the citizens did with the lousy king, just like the slaves did with the lousy master, you have to put your faith and trust that God can orchestrate the outcome. This is hard to do, but it comes down to are you going to do your own devices or are you going to do it God's way? Are you going to trust yourself or are you going to trust God? So again, I'm not ganging up on the women. That's what the first six verses on. Wait till I get to the guys. Just stay with me. If you do your job the right way, God's way, does it work every single time? No, of course not. There's people out there that are listening who've had horrible husbands who never came around. Um, and you did it this way. But it works in the majority of cases. You're, you're always going to have one-offs, and Scripture allows for one-offs. But in this situation, God's saying, if you do it my way, in the vast majority of the cases, the men, who are very simple, are just going to follow right along and do what I've programmed them to do, and they won't even realize they're doing it. They're stepping into that role. They're being accountable. They're being the leaders. They're being responsible. All those things that you hoped he would do with his life, he's suddenly doing because you're showing these qualities. Now, I don't know for you people who study, but there was a famous evangelist back in the 1800s. His name was George Mueller. He's one of those guys that I also like to read along with Spurgeon um, and uh, Corson and some of the others. But Mueller tells a story, which I believe is a true story. He's telling it uh, as if it is a true story. And it goes something like this. Um, there was a wealthy German businessman. His wife, his wife was a uh, devout believer, a, a strong Christian. Well, this guy was a heavy drinker every night to the tavern. He'd usually come home drunk as a skunk. Um, 
And every night, his wife would do the same thing. She would send the servants to bed. She would wait up until the wee hours until he returned. She would receive him in kindly, never scold him, never complain. At times, she'd even have to undress him and put him to bed because he was too drunk to do so. So one night in the tavern, he's kind of bragging to his cronies. And he's saying, yeah, yes, yeah, she'll do all that for me. And they couldn't believe it because their wives didn't do that. Their wives nagged them and complained and, and, and griped at them all the time because of them going out to the tavern and coming home drunk. So he said, you know what? I bet if we go to my house right now, my wife will be sitting up waiting for me. She'll come to the door. She'll give us a royal welcome. And she'll even make us supper, even though it's a late hour, if I ask her to. Well, they were all really skeptical at first, but they decided to go along and see. So sure enough, they, all this, this horde of drunk guys comes to her door. She received each one in courteously and then willingly agreed to make them supper. And after she had set the table for all of them without the slightest trace of resentment, she went off to bed. Well, the minute she went in her room and closed the door, one of this guy's friends looked at him and said, what kind of man are you to treat such a good woman so miserably? And so he threw his napkin down, got up, never finished his meal, and left. And then his next friend, same thing. And one by one by one by one, all these men got up without even finishing their meal and stormed out of their house, disgusted with their friend's behavior. Within about a half an hour, the husband, he never listened to his wife, never listened to anybody, but he became deeply convicted by the behavior of his friends concerning his, his actions. And he went into his wife's room and asked her to forgive him, to pray for him. He repented. He surrendered his life to Christ. You, you can't make this stuff up. And from that moment on, um, he followed Christ the rest of his days. George Mueller kind of concludes this section and says, uh, don't be discouraged. If you have to suffer from unconverted relatives, perhaps very shortly the Lord may give you the desire of your heart and answer your prayer for them. But in the meantime, seek to commend the truth, not by reproaching them on account of their behavior towards you, but by manifesting toward them the meekness, gentleness, and kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that quote. That's a beautiful way of putting it. So before we go on to verse 3, 4, and then we'll finish up hurriedly. That was the longest section, guys, so I will expedite. We have about four minutes left in this session, and we have about 28 minutes left overall. I will leave time for Q&A at the end. So I'm gonna ask everybody, we have 16 participants on here now. If you possibly can, you're only halfway through, please log back in in about a minute or two and uh, go grab something to drink and then rejoin us here in about uh, a minute or two and I will see you back for session two. Thanks.